Uh, we're still in the first chapter of Second Peter. I saw a necessity to hang here for a while. It is the first chapter in this short epistle is, is very important uh, for what he's going to say uh, in the balance of chapters, which is only chapter two and uh, chapter three. And so uh, we want to do justice uh, somewhat uh, to this uh, first chapter of uh, Peter. So we're, we're gonna look at the latter verses, um, verses uh, 16 uh, through uh, 21, which is the end of the chapter. And if you would follow me, I'll be reading in the NASB uh, translation. For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rise in your hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. I want to speak to you from this subject, the unquestionable testimony of Christ in scriptures. Yes, the unquestionable testimony of Christ in scripture and as a subtitle of that, uh, yes, reset to the default, reset to the default. In this uh, computer age, we are familiar with the word default, where the original settings or programs are set at a, a default and any changes that occur subsequent to uh, the original programming is moves it uh, beyond the default. And sometimes in order to uh, fix a problem that arises in our computers, sometimes we have to reset uh, to the default. We have to go back to uh, the original a program, amen. Yeah. And and I and I use that to say to uh, you uh, this morning that uh, the scriptures, amen, is always our reset to default. If we ever find ourselves going too far away from where the scriptures uh, speak of, then you and I need to reset to the default that that is has always been the stimulus for a revival for a renewal for the people of God turning back to God is that they reset to the default they turn back to the word of God there is a there's a natural inclination in you and in me to move away from the truth yes in this age in which we live, people are uh, user, are adding a whole lot of addendums and, and self-help books and all kind of other things. 
and teachings that is not scripture and it subsequently has is 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 moving us away from the real teachings of Christ in the way that you and I can correct that is that we we reset. Amen. Yeah, we we go back to the with the original word, Amen. the the spoken word. Amen. And that's the only spoken word is the word of God. Amen. What it has said, yes. And that should be an ongoing process in our life that when we are drifting and moving away from Christ. Yes, and that occurs as we move away from the word and we, we turn back and reset to the default. This is, this is what Peter uh, wants them to remember. You recall in uh, last week, uh, uh, we, we, we were still, we was talking still about how we need to, to grow uh, in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And, and the last point was the way we grow is that we remember in verses 12 through 15 where he says, therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you are all, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth, which is present with you, I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will also be diligent, diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind, to remember that you and I make sure that we have a default. And our default is the word of God. Peter is going off the scene. He is ready to depart from this world. He understands that soon he's going to depart. He won't take his own life. He won't die of some kind of disease or illness. The, the, the mural will cause his head, just like the Apostle Paul, to be lifted up. He will be crucified, many believe, upside down for the cause of Christ. But however, it doesn't really matter how he dies, he's going to depart. Yes, we, we concern ourselves today how we're going to depart. Scripture never concerns itself with how you're going to depart. Scripture only concerns itself with of those that are going to depart into the very presence of God. It doesn't matter if you're eaten by lions. It doesn't matter if disease takes you. It doesn't matter if you die in a car accident. If it doesn't even matter if somebody murders you and takes your life, how the Christian exits this life, even though we would prefer to have a nice smooth transition, it really doesn't matter with God how we depart this life that's in the hands of God, but we know that when we exit, those that put their trust in Him, yes, and we're going to go into His presence, amen. And I said last week, I hope that your aspiration is that when you go into heaven, you will bust heaven doors wide open, you will, your life will be so lived that when you exit here. There will be great anticipation for you to enter into the very presence of the Lord. Yes. Yes, that was Peter's expectation. But Peter had a responsibility to speak to those who are going to be left behind. And his, his word to them is remember. Yes. Remember what I have said to you, remember how you are to grow that, yes, that you need to add to your faith virtue and, and to virtue, yes, uh, virtue uh, knowledge and to knowledge patience and, 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 and to patience brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness love. Remember, yes, you have uh, a default that you need to 
revisit every now and then. So he, Peter is encouraging them. So he's moving forward. And he's anticipating to be going into the presence of the Lord. He says, I want you to remember. You won't have me to speak to you anymore. You won't, you won't have me to encourage you anymore, but don't worry. God has already made a way for you to continue to move forward. Yes. Through the things that have already been proclaimed. Through the things that have already been taught. Yes, Peter uh, is, is like Paul in that regard. Uh, where you recall in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, uh, Paul also uh, speaks of, speaks of his, his own uh, departure and exit out of this world and anticipating, amen, uh, that, uh, that he is going to leave and, and he is going to, amen, I like to say, bust heaven's doors uh, wide open, actually, uh, in that uh, fourth chapter where he says in verse seven, for I am ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Amen. And so he encourages uh, uh, Paul also, knowing his departure, he also encourages uh, Timothy to continue in, amen, the scriptures. Notice what he says in, in the third chapter, verse 10 through 15. He says, now you follow uh, my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and suffering, such as has happened to me in Antioch and at Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ will be persecuted, but evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue, he says, in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Paul encourages them. And so this is what Timothy is doing. He's encouraging them encouraging them to, to, to move on to, to uh, after his departure to continue in the things because when we get to chapter two and three, he's going to warn them that false teachers and scoffers and those who mock the word of God will abide. And, and we're seeing a day today where there are many mockers and scoffers and many false teachers who are proclaim, claiming to proclaim the word of God. And this is the way Peter prepares those who are going to follow after him and believe and trust in the Christ is that you need to continue to remember your default. Because there are going to be those that's going to teach things that are not of God. And the only way that you're going to be able to discern the difference is that you are built up in the word of God. That is tantamount. Yes, I spoke of the fact that life speaks of growing, progressing, and either you're living or you're dying. That is no greater truth than as it's, as it's applied to the word of God. Either you're growing in the word of God or you are declining in your understanding of the word of God. Something else is overtaking your thinking, your you, it may be your own uh, in, uh, thinking that your own intellect and knowledge is superior to the word of God or equal to the word of God. Or you may put your trust in someone else who you thinking is more, who's, who's the only one that can interpret the word of God. And you may, and, and the whole thing is that your confidence is not in the word, but it's in something else 
And if that's the case, you are declining. Yes, you none of us stay the same. We saw in Sunday school how Saul started off. He on a on a King Saul on a real good note. He was called chosen of God to be the king of Israel. And and as one of the ways to authenticate that God had called him was that he went among the prophets and he prophesied amongst the other prophets. He spoke the word of God. And, and from that point forward, his life became a descent to the end of his life. And rather proclaiming the word of God, he sought a witch, he sought a soothsayer, he sought someone who was the enemy of God to speak, thus saith the Lord. That's how far any one of us can move if we do not default. And if our default is not the word of God, yes, we need to default to the word of God. Well, the unquestionable testimony here, yeah, one reason why uh, one reason I have to default is because the unquestionable testimony of Christ is in the scriptures. Amen. How do we know anything about Christ? We're, we're not receiving an audible voice from heaven. We're, we're not receiving dreams, amen, today amen. in the way God is speaking to us. We're, we're, we're not, amen, receiving even the word of a prophet coming from out of town. We have the confidence and the authority of God speaking to us is through his word. That's, that is the unquestionable testimony of Christ. It's in scripture. Like he spoke with his disciples in his ministry, when they walk with him, through his word, he speaks to you and I. Yes, and either, and either you and I are growing in our knowledge of Christ through our study and ponderance and observation of the word of God or you and I are declining and even losing ground of what we previously had. Yes, nothing stays the same. Either you're growing, that's why, you know, you may be a hundred years old, but still come to Bible study, amen. Yeah. You may have been studying the Bible all your life, but still, Make yourself available in, in your own private life. Study the word of God. It's not so important that you come to Bible study, but it is important that you continue to study the word of God. Yes. Yes. Amen. There is going to come a time when we will not be able to even gather on internet and in the other means to study the word of God. The Bible speaks of a time coming when the, the devil would do a great, uh, will accomplish a great evil in suppressing the word of God where it does not go out in any public form. It means no preaching across the pulpit, no hearing of the word of God on radio or on television or on our iPhones, that there will be a suppression of the word of God. Yes. But that day has 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 not come and so you and i should avail ourselves as much as we can to take in the word of god so as not only for ourselves but we might be in a position then to share the word of god with with others well what will be uh their greatest advantage in light of peter's departure it will be, again, to remember that if they, if someone comes teaching something false, if someone ridicules them and makes them think something other than the word of God, that they would default to the word. They would go back and re-examine the word of God. And so 
three-point outline in this section we we'll to talk about is the testimony of the son witnessed by the apostles, the testimony of the son witnessed by the father, the testimony of the son witnessed by the scriptures. And it's, it's very interesting. All of this is encouched in scripture. We have the testimony of apostles in the scriptures. We have the testimony of the Father, where? In the scriptures. And we have the testimony, amen, of, of, of the scriptures, of course, in the scriptures. You want to see a wonderful testimony of how the scripture speaks of God is to read that 119th Psalm and to examine that and to study it. Let me, uh, first of all, the testimony of the Son, because understand Christ is the center of it all. Yes, he's, he's the center. He is the one that um, brings it all. He is, the, uh, he is the one that we are beholding and should be beholding when we're looking at the scriptures. Notice what he says in 16. I'll just read to 17, the A portion of verse 17. It says, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father. I'll stop there. The we he's referring to here speaks generally of the 12 apostles yeah. and sp more specifically of Peter, James, and John. He's going to yeah. say that even more clearly uh, in verse, I believe it's uh, 19, uh, 18, where he says, And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the mountain, holy mountain. Here, Peter is testifying uh, in terms of why it is that they need to default to the word of God. And he starts off saying, speaking of the apostles and what they saw, they were eyewitnesses. They saw it for the first time. They saw it, amen, when no one else saw uh, uh, in that age, uh, the what they had seen they bore witness to the events of christ the apostles uh -huh. to be an apostle in that day the technical idea of apostle was one that had walked with the lord for a period of time and had seen his miracles and heard his teachings witnessed his death burial and his resurrection now, you may call yourself an apostle today, and because the word apostle just means to be sent, amen? But the real idea of apostle was one that bore witness. You see, before you could be sent, you have to have had, you would have to have heard and seen the clear message of Christ. And these were the uh, apostles of the early church, and you have to add apostle Paul to that, that whom the Lord Jesus Christ taught him in the desert of Arabia, taught him, and we beheld the resurrected Lord who taught him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is these who have the authority to proclaim the truth, and these who autographed, who, who, who wrote the word of God that you and I have today as a New Testament testimony of the events concerning our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Yes, he says, it's the testimony of son, it's, it's witnessed first by the apostles. He says, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's, he's saying that we, we saw him in his glory. And you have to say, when did you see him in his glory? If you, where you recall that, Jesus had, was called up to the to call Peter, James, and John up into the mountain of transfiguration, and there he disrobed himself. He unveiled himself. 
that glory that was covered by the flesh came out on the outside and they beheld, yes, his, his glory. By the way, he first of all says, we, uh, we have not followed cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord. Peter says, this is not no myth. This is not no fable. We're not talking about something that is 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 not true. It's it's a it's a lie. Amen. You, you see, the idea that it was a, a, a tale or a fable is something that is cunningly crafted in order to trick somebody to to spread a a lie or a a a, a fictional story. Peter says that. This is not fiction. With my eyes, I beheld. With my ears, I heard. And with my mind, I comprehended all that was what was happening. That he later came to full understanding of yes. and was able to proclaim it, amen, before those who had ears to hear. And so Peter, if you would, he stakes his entire reputation based upon what he has heard and seen, it not being a fable or a myth or a lie. I don't care who, what you, you may say or hear somebody say, well, the scripture is this, the scripture that. Peter says he is an eyewitness. He saw the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. And we and I stand on the teachings of the apostolic doctrine of those that were eyewitnesses to the teachings, the ministry work, and the death, burial, resurrection, and the ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who are you going to believe? Yes. You see, yes. Paul also warned the myth he says, uh, he told Peter in 1 uh, Timothy, rather, 1-4, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. Yes, he, he warns them against myth. He also warned them uh, in that fourth chapter of the uh, second Timothy, where he tells them that, uh, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tinkle, uh, tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desire and will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside, aside to myths. Now, that those that do not want to hear the word of God, they will descend into hearing myths whether it's uh, myths in their own culture or there's myth in some other culture, in the Far Eastern culture. There is a great danger today of Christians moving into the circle where they are in, uh, trying to uh, study these Eastern cult religions, getting into their meditations and their uh, teachings, etc., and it will draw them away from the truth. And this was Paul warning, don't be indulging in myths. And Peter says, we did not declare unto you a myth, but we declared unto you the truth regarding what we have seen and heard. Yes. I love what John, 1 John 1, 1 says, what was from the beginning what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. That's what they proclaimed. Not no myth, but what they were an eyewitness to. Amen. Amen. Yes. They saw his baptism and they, yes. Yes, and they saw him at his crucifixion, and they saw him at his transfer at the transfiguration. Amen. He he was unveiled before them. Mark uh, 
9 says, and as they came down from the um, mountain, um, I'm sorry, uh, that's, uh, let me move up a little closer there. Uh, Mark the ninth chapter. I'll just go to Matthew the 17th chapter since I'm a little closer to that. This is another account of the transfiguration. It says in verse 17, after six days, Jesus uh, taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into the high mountain and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. Yes. He goes on to say, and Moses and Elijah was there with him, but they saw his glory. This, this, this never, this, this, this never forgot. Uh, uh, they, this is something they never forgot. They, they never got away from uh, moving away from that vision that they had received on the mountain of transfiguration. John 1 and 14 says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He says, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. They never got away from that realization of his glory. In Acts 4, 19 to 20, Peter's preaching says, but Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard, once they had saw and heard all the complete things that Jesus had accomplished, they were never the same. And they were never going back. Yes. And they were going to move forward in the light of his grace, learning and growing more and more in Christ Jesus. Yes. None of them, even Paul, no one reached the apex. No one reached all that one can take of Christ Jesus because he is inexhaustible. You cannot exhaust him intellectually. He cannot be exalted, exalted intellectually in us understanding all that is to be known about his person and his work. Yes. They testify again in verse 17. Uh, yes, uh, rather, not 17. We're going back to verse, uh, actually, verse 18. And we heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. That's what that's what Peter says. So the testimony of the son is first from the apostles. Then, and then notice here is that it's real quickly the testimony. Uh, the second testimony is from the father himself, the witness of the father, where he says in the C portion of verse 17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Yeah. The father speaks, you recall on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. In Matthew uh, 17 uh, chapter, uh, there the account of the transfiguration, which is recorded in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In, in Matthew the 17th chapter, it says, verse 5, while he yet spake, behold, a bright, a bright cloud overshadowed, overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Yeah. This was, amen, the, actually the third time recorded in Scripture where the Father broke in uh, to time to announce something in respect to his son. We saw that uh, in the first time at his baptism, at the beginning of his ministry, where Luke, uh, the third chapter, verse 22 and 21 says, now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was open and the Holy Ghost descended in a, 
in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, speaking of Jesus, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. Yes. That was at the commencement of his ministry that that very onset, God broke in before he took one step into the, 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 the accomplishment of his ministry. He declared his acceptableness, his pleasingness toward his son. This is my beloved son. He, he sanctified, he certified that this is his son. That is a unique relationship with the father, the father of eternity is eternally linked to the son of eternity. And they have always abided along with the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit in that triune relationship in the Godhead forever and ever. And it was never a broken relationship. This is, yes, he is, the father is announcing that this is his son. You, you could not tell that that was his son. He was, he was in human form. He was, he, was, he was born, came into this world through the incarnation and born as all of us are born. He didn't have a crown of glory on his head, but he was still the son of God. <clears throat> this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He, he announced his pleasure with his son even before his son had completed one work because God the father fully trusted in his son. Yes, yes. You know, it's, it's a danger when we can go around and talk about the son, amen, and think less about the son then what the Father has declared, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. God the Father found no fault in his Son. He found nothing displeasurable in his yes. Son. Yes. Anyone that finds something displeasurable in Christ, they do not know him. They're the child of the devil. This, this is the father speaking. He said it at his baptism. He, he said it at the end of his ministry when Jesus was troubled because he had to go to Calvary to die for our sins. And that 12th chapter of John, verse 27, he says, now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? This is Jesus says, he says, and he then he praise father save me from this hour but for this cause came i into this world came i into this hour amen father he says glorify thy name he totally submits to the will of his father and out of as he's speaking and as he's praying he says then came there a voice from heaven saying i have both glorified it and will glorify it again the father intrudes into the agony of his son, while the, those who were hearing his voice, not the apostles or disciples, nor the religious rulers or anybody else understood the agony of the son of God. But the father says, yes, I will I have glorified you and you shall be glorified. The promise of the father. Yes. In one sense, all that Jesus did was glory. His incarnation was glorious. His, his walk on earth was glorious. Amen. Oh, how he went about doing good, healing the sick, giving sight to the blind, raising the dead, casting out demons, feeding the 5,000. All of his works were glorious. And perhaps his greatest works was when he when he when he submitted himself to the cross and died for your yeah. sins and for my sins, he died on the cross. He was crucified, and, and even at his crucifixion and his death, and it speaks that that being glorious for this hour, I came into the world. Yes, I have glorified, it and I shall glorify you. And it speaks of his 
death, burial, and resurrection as his glory. Yes. And so we, the father intrudes at the end, at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, he intrudes into creation, into time, space, and matter at the, at, at the end of the ministry. And he also does it in the middle part. And here he is at the transfiguration was the middle part of his ministry after he had shown that he was the holy and righteous son of man, that he was the perfect sacrifice, that he was right. And he was the only one who could give